The Radio Planet by Ralph Milne Farley At the Terrible Chapter 11 When Miles Cabot left his encampment beside the little brook, he hastened downstream to where the brook joined the big river, along the edge of where there stretched a sandy beach. Falling on his knees, he picked up handful after handful of silver sands. There was still plenty of daylight left for him to examine the multitude of shiny metallic particles. There could be no doubt of it. These sand held some metal, which could be separated out in such the same manner as that in which the California gold miners of 1849 used to wash for gold. But only time would tell whether or not this metal was the much-to-be-desired plantain plantinum, which the radio man needed for the grids, filaments, plates, and wires of the vacuum tubes. On the morrow, he would wash for this metal using the wooden pans which he had brought for that purpose. The precious dust he would carry back to Verakimi, melt into small lumps, if possible, and then try to analyze its composition in the laboratory. As he sat on the sandy beach and thus laid out his plans, he, his thoughts gradually wandered away from scientific lines, and he began to again worry about Lilla. It was many days since she had sent the SOS, which had recalled him from Earth to Poros. Whatever she had feared must have happened by now. It was possible that he would never be able to effect a return to Cupia. Why not then accept the inevitable, settle down permanently among the Ver Kings, and solace himself as best he could? Even an ordinarily star star stalwart stole. Sol would have done his best, and have been satisfied with that. But Miles Standish Cabot possessed that indomitable will which had given rise to the Perovian proverb, you cannot kill a Minorian. To such a man defeat was impossible. He would rescue his princess Lilla in the end. That was all there was to it. So he laid his plans with precision as he sat on the sandy shore of the Perovian river in the crimsoning twilight. Before the velvet darkness completely enveloped the planet, the Earthman arose from the sands and began to return up the valley of the little estuary. But as he was hurrying along and was passing through a small grove of trees, a dark form noiselessly dropped on him from above. The creature lit squarely on his back, wrapping its furry legs around his abdomen and its furry arms around his neck. Although taken completely by surprise, Kabat wrenched the creature's feet apart and then threw it over his head as a Bucking Bronco would throw a rider, a jiu-jitsu trick he had learned from one of the Japanese gymnasts at the college. The Roy, for that is what Kabat's assailant proved to be, scrambled quickly to his feet, although a bit stunned, and crouched ready to spring at him again. The Earthman planted his feet firmly apart, clenched his fists, and waited, awaited the onslaught. But then, when the creature charged, he met him at the point of jaw with a well-aimed blow. Down crashed the furry one. Kabat was rubbing his bruised knuckles and viewing his falling antagonist with some satisfaction when suddenly he was seized around the knees from behind and was hurled prone by one of the neatest football tackles he'd ever experienced. Squirming quickly to a sitting position, he dealt the Roy who held his legs a stinging blow beside the ear. The grip on his knees loosened and he was just about to scramble erect when a third assailant caught him around the throat and pulled him backward. Then scores of furry savages swarmed upon him from every side. Yet still he fought, until his elbows were pinioned behind his back, his eyes were blindfolded, and the gag placed between his teeth. Thereupon, he ceased struggling, not because there was no fight left in him, but rather because he wisely decided to save his strength for some time when he might really be able to use it. So he offered no further resistance when he was picked up and thrown across a pair of brawny shoulders and carried off he knew not whither. Finally, after what seemed many hours, he was unceremoniously dumped onto the ground and then jerked roughly to his feet. His bandage was snatched off and he found himself standing in the center of a circle of flames, confronting a large, squat, and particularly repulsive gray fur Roy, who sat with some pretense of dignity upon a round boulder in front of him. Beside him stood another Roy, evidently the one who had brought him thither. This one now spoke. See the pretty Ver King which I have brought you? If that's a Ver King, the fat one remarked, then I'm my own father. If he isn't a Ver King, the other countered, then why does he wear Ver King leather armor? Answer me that. Ver King or not, the fat one declared, he will do very nicely to string up by the heels and shoot arrows at. For quite evidently, he is no Roy. What say you to that, my fine target? The guard removed the gag. I say, Miles evenly replied, that you had better not take any such liberties with me. And why not furless, the seated Roy sneered. 
First, let me ask you a question, Miles said. Who is King of the Roys, Grodd the Silent or At the Terrible? Grodd the Silent, most assuredly. Why do you ask? And do you know Prince Otto, his son, Otto the Bold, most assuredly? Know then, the captive asserted, that I am no Ver King, but rather a Minorian, which is a sort of creature I'll venture you have never met before. Furthermore, I am a particular personal friend of Otto the Bold. He will not thank you to string up Kabat the Minorian by heels and shoot arrows into him. I demand to be taken before Prince Otto. Thereat the fat Roy smiled, a crafty smile. I shall take you before at the terrible, he said. It thus became evident that this fat chief... Tre chieftain had falsely asserted his belief in the kingship of Grodd for the purpose of securing for Miles an admission to which side the Earthman favored. The rest of the night, Miles spent on a pile of smelly bedding in a tent. He was still bound and kept under constant surveillance by frequently changing guards. By morning, his arms below the elbow had become completely numb, in spite of his having loosened his bonds somewhat by straining against them. When the velvet night had given place to the silver day, the guard brought some coarse porridge in a rough stone bowl, which he held to the prisoner's lips until it was all consumed. Miles thanked him politely, then asked if he would mind chafing the numbed arms. For reply, the soldier kicked him savagely. Get up, he ordered. The time is here to start the march. You'll wish the rest of you were numb, too, when at the terrible start shooting arrows into your inverted carcass. Precisely. Presently. Miles was driven into the open, and the tents were struck and loaded into carts, probably stolen from the Ver Kings, and the furry warriors took up the march, with their prisoner in their midst. The fat chief alone rode in a cart. All others walked. By straining at the thongs which bound his arms, Miles further loosened them sufficiently to relieve pressure on blood vessels, and then by wriggling fingers he managed to finally restore some circulation. After that, he began to take some interest in his surrounding. His captors were a coarse-looking lot of brutes with long, gangling arms, thick-set necks, low foreheads, and prognathous jaws. In general, they more closely resembled the anthropoid apes of the earth than they resembled the really human, although furred, fair kings. Their weapons, wooden spears and swords, and flint knives were like those of the fair kings, only cruder. They marched without any particular order or discipline, and jested coarsely with each other as they ambled along. After taking in all this, Miles next turned his attention to the country through which they were passing. The trail led upward into the mountains. This at once aroused his interest. Here and there he noted what he felt sure must be zinc blend. Yes, and cropping out of rocks on the left was an unmistakable rosette of Galena crystal. The radio man was sincerely glad he had been captured, and so he even joked jovially with the soldiers around him until they became quite friendly. At one point, their route lay across a foaming mountain stream. <sighs> Sorry, and by means of a log bridge, as they were crossing over, one of the furry soldiers had the misfortune to stumble, and in another instant completely lost his footing and plunged headlong into the stream below. He happened to be one who had recently become particularly chummy with the captive. Poor fellow, one of the guard casually remarked. It's too bad he can't swim. I can, Miles shouted. Quick, someone cut my bonds. And before anyone could interfere, young and impetuous Roy had drawn his knife and severed the earthman's bonds, thus permitting him to dive after the poor creature who was rapidly being washed downstream by a swift current. It all happened in an instant. After a few swift strokes brought Miles up to the others, but it became no easy matter to reach the shore. However, the troop of Roy's showed much more interest in regaining their captive than they had shown in rescuing their comrade, and thus, by aid of spears, finally dragged the two ashore. Then Kabat was bound again, and the march resumed. The carts had detoured, and so the fat chief had not seen the episode. Better not tell him, anyone, one of the guards admonished, or it'll go hard with the youngster. Our leader would not relish any chance of not being able to present this furless ver king to at the terrible. And will at shoot arrows into me? Miles asked. Oh, most assuredly. Miles thought to himself, I guess they are right, especially if at knows how I was befriended to Arkilu, whom he covets. Then he asked, and when am I to see the terrible one? Tomorrow morning, was the reply. However, Miles Cabot fell asleep at the encampment that night, wondering when he would get that radio set finished for a talk with Lilla, and wondering whether there really was Galena Crystal that he had passed on the road. But Galena Crystal wasn't going to help him with At the Terrible.